Well, all righty. We're going to be in chapter 5 in Romans. Chapter 5 in Romans. Which in your book, in the workbook, the second workbook, is going to be lesson 16. Page 35. And today, we're going to talk about God's extreme makeover. Stana loves HGTV. We're remodeling our kitchen and bathroom. So it's nonstop HGTV. <laughs> well, honey, what do you like about HGTV? Before and after? Stana says she likes to see what, what can be done and the before and after. Yeah, that's what most people like about HGTV is they like to watch the... Um, the designers and the constructors take something that's really messed up and turn it into something really, really cool. And we're doing that. Yeah, kind of, kind of like this one up here. There's a nice makeover. I mean, you have a one-story house. It was kind of junky. If you look at the top house, it doesn't look anything like the bottom house, does it? But they're the same house, which is kind of cool that people can do that. Let's take a look at a couple of other makeovers. How about this one? That's a nice makeover, huh? Same person. How about this one? <laughs> this is a puppy dog. It's hard to believe that cute little one on the right was underneath all that hair and stuff. That was pretty. It is. It's the same. It's the same animal. It is. I don't agree. I think it's same. How about this one? That is not her. It is her. It could be. It is. Look at her eyes. Yeah, it's the that's same person. Yeah, that's, that's a pretty big makeover. How about this one? <laughs> Hard to believe that cute little dog was underneath all that. I don't believe that one. It's true. Oh, you can't always believe it. It's true. It's true. Well, no matter how extreme the makeover on HDTV or some of these other ones we saw, it's nothing like the makeover that we've received from God. God's extreme makeover on us is infinitely more wonderful than any makeover of a house or a person in makeup because what God did was took us from where we were in Romans, the first three chapters, and brought us into an entirely new relationship with him and did a lot of things to make us the people that we are today. Some of the things that we are today, we can feel and know, and some of the things um, that God has done for us, we really won't appreciate till we get into heaven. But God has done an extreme makeover on us. You don't think that's a, the same guy? Um, could be. Same guy. Most of us, if we were to qualify and categorize our life before coming to Christ, it might look like this. But even if you didn't think your life was like this, spiritually speaking, according to what we have already learned about the way we were before we came to Christ, that's what our life looked like spiritually. And God has made us over completely. So what has he done? Well, Romans chapter 5 describes the things that God has done for us in giving us this extreme spiritual makeover that he talks about in the book of Romans. So let's take a look at what God has done for us in the first 11 verses of Romans chapter 5. Now, Romans chapter 5 begins in verse 1 by this statement, Therefore, Having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So here's the first part of our makeover. He says, therefore. Now, whenever you see the word therefore, you need to take note of what it's there for. Paul says, therefore. In other words, based on all of the things that we were, and based on our relationship with God, because of our faith in Him, he talked about having been justified by faith. 
And what does the word justified mean? Does anyone remember from our discussion last time? Okay, declared righteous. There is an interesting, uh, easy way to remember what it means to be justified. It's just as if I'd never sinned. Yeah, forgiven us. He's forgiven us so completely that it's just as if in his sight, we have never committed any sin at all. That's a pretty amazing makeover. Stana says we have to receive that makeover in order for God to receive us. Why do we have to have that makeover for, in order for God to receive us? Why is it important that we be sinless in his sight? Because God is sinless. Because God is sinless. God is perfect. God is righteous. God will not accept, accept anything less in his presence. He can't. He can't because he's holy. He and so, yeah. And so for us to be acceptable to God, we have to be as if we'd never sinned. And we can't accomplish that in our own effort. No matter how hard we try, no matter how good we are, we cannot be sinless in our own effort. It takes a supernatural makeover, it's which like God has provided. Say to the kids when you're talking to them about God, God did. <laughs> Stan, Stan is referring to a time when I was teaching the kids when they were young yeah, we were but I was we were teaching them about God and I was telling my daughter Rachel and my son Jason this was before our little one Tabby was born you know we were just like who made the moon God did and who made the stars God did who made the sun God did who made you God did who made me? God did. So one day I walked into a room and the whole room was just a complete mess. Toys everywhere, clothes all over the place, everything. And I came in and I said, who made this mess? And my little daughter Rachel looked up and said, God did. <laughs> and I said, no, God did not make this mess. But in, but in our lives, we make the mess, but God cleaned it up by sending his son to die for us, that by faith we can be just as if we'd never sinned simply by believing that God will justify us by our faith in him. And so we have been justified. It's a done deal. It's past tense. Having been justified. And that means it can never be unjustified. This structure in the Greek, the way Paul writes it, he says, having been forever and always and never to change, been justified by faith. So if someone comes to you and says, well, you can lose your salvation. We were talking about this in church because that whole passage in John 15 where he says, well, if you don't do what you're supposed to do, we're going to cut the vine and throw you into the fire. And Stan was saying, well, that sounds a little like you could lose your salvation. And I, and I had to clarify it for what he was talking about there. But this verse here makes it clear, unequivocally, that we have been justified forever and remain perfect in his sight by faith because of our faith in Jesus Christ. And so because of our faith and having been justified, what's the first benefit from that? I mean, that's the first benefit is that we're justified forever. But what's the second benefit in this verse? We have peace with God. What kind of peace is this, do you think? Right. So there's really two verses that you're touching on there. The first one, Jesus said, my peace I give to you. Peace I, I leave with you. My peace I give to you. In this world, you'll have tribulation. But be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. And Stan was commenting that we can have peace in this world, regardless of what's going on around us. We can have peace that passes all understanding because logically it doesn't make sense when all of the world is crashing down around you that you would have a peace. But we can have that peace because we know that this is not our home and we have a future and that God is in control of everything that happens. And that brings us great peace. Maybe you've felt that peace from time to time. The other verse is pray in all things pray. 
And the peace that passes out all understanding will rule your heart. And so there is a peace that comes from God to us that we can receive from God. One of the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, a contentment, a satisfaction, a in the midst of turmoil, we can ride above the wave. That's a, we have that kind of peace. But look what he says. He says, having been justified, we have peace with God, not from God. There is another kind of peace, and it's peace with God. And that's really the peace that Paul is focusing on here. What is peace with God? Back in 1942, I'm sorry, 1945, on the battleship of the USS Missouri, which was parked in the Bay of Tokyo, Japan, it was the end of World War II. And on that great battleship, there were two delegations, one from Japan and one from the United States. And they sat down at a table and they signed something. And what did they sign? They signed a surrender, a peace agreement between the United States and Japan. And in that moment, Japan had peace with the United States. They didn't have peace from the United States because they were still in turmoil and there was a lot going on in Japan that needed to be corrected. But they had peace with the United States. Because what were they before this peace treaty was signed? They were, fighting. They were enemies, weren't they? They were fighting. They were hostile to one another. They were not friends. They were enemies and out to destroy one another. And we saw in the first part of Romans, what was our relationship to God before we came to Jesus Christ? We were enemies of God. That's hard to grasp for some people that we're enemies of God. But that's exactly what the Bible says we were. We did not have peace with God. We were an enmity with God. Look at what Colossians 1, 19 through 21 says. For it pleased the Father that in him, that is Jesus Christ, all the fullness should dwell. And by him to reconcile all things to himself. By him, whether things on earth or things in heaven, had made, having made peace, that's what we're talking about, through the blood of his cross. And listen to this. And you, and you, and me, who once were alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now he has reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and blameless and above reproach in his sight. Peace. God has brought us to a place of peace with him. By the death and the burial and the resurrection and the blood of Jesus Christ. But doesn't God love all people? I mean, why, why do we need peace with God if God loves everybody? Didn't God love everybody? Yeah, but I thought God loved everybody. God is love, oh, God. love, love, love. All you love. need is love. Oh, God so loved the world. That's what he's referring to. He mm -hmm. loved all of his creation. Mm -hmm. And he gave his only son. He's very disappointed. <laughs> he's very disappointed. <laughs> he loves him, but he's really disappointed. <laughs> does, God love his, does God love everybody? Does God love all people? Yes, yes he does. Can mm -hmm. God's love alone save all people if it's just love. That's right. God's love alone, Stanis says, without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sin. God's love alone can't save you. There's a lot of people that are going to go to hell that God loves. But he can't save them through love. He has to save them through the price being paid for their sins. 
and they have to receive that price as payment for their sins. And unfortunately, some will not. Some will not. But God they, still loves them. Yes, right? but they said no. Right. So there has to be a receiving of God's forgiveness through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ in order for God to bring peace between us and him. But that's the benefit when we come to Christ. We now have peace with God. He's not our enemy. He's not somebody we have to fear. He's not somebody we have to cower from or hide from. He's someone that we can come to. Even when we blow it, even when we sin, we can come to him. Say, I'm sorry. We confess our sins. He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins. So the first benefit is that we have received justification. We stand in a position of complete and total sinless perfection in his sight. That doesn't mean we're sinless. It doesn't mean we're perfect. It means that in his sight, he sees us sinless and perfect because we're covered by the blood of Jesus Christ. The second benefit is we have peace. We're reconciled to him. Right? What's the third benefit we have from, from our relationship with God through Christ? We have access to God. Now, this is a wonderful thought that Paul gives us here, because what's the one thing all the religions of the world are trying to do? They're trying to get access to God. Look at all the things. I pray five times toward Mecca every day. I offer incense to the, the elephant God. I do this. I do that. I go to church. I whatever. They're all trying to gain access to God through doing some good deed that they think God will appreciate and respond to. But the only true faith is that God will accept that person and mm -hmm. Stana says the only true access is because God reaches down and allows us access to him. And that's exactly what Paul says. And through whom? Okay, through whom? Who's the whom here? Through Jesus. whom? Through Jesus. We also have access by faith into this grace in which we stand. So Paul says, not only are we justified, not only we have peace, we have access to God. We don't have to come begging for his attention. We don't have to do things that we think are going to allow us to get his attention. You don't have to do that. Well, not, not that we don't have to. All the doing you want to do is not going to do it. Right. <laughs> it's not going to do it. But here's the, here's the catch. How many believers who have trusted Christ as their Savior think that they have to do lots of good things in order for God to continue to love them and accept them. Well, You'd be surprised. Unfortunately, um, you know, if, if that's the if they, if they, if they, if they say, okay, God, show me, teach me that in your word, you know, do this. Well, that's, that's exactly what Paul is saying here that we have. We have access to God, and it has nothing to do with whether you went to church, prayed three times today, um, put on your makeup correctly, you gave to the Wait poor. Minute, I, really draw <laughs> I draw a line with the makeup. We have access to God. Notice what it says. Through whom we have access to God by all our good deeds. It doesn't say that, does it? Grace. Into this grace in which we stand. And it's by faith. It's by believing that God has forgiven us. Believing that God is at peace with us. Believing that we have access to God in order that we might continue to walk by faith and not by legalistic do's and don'ts. So many Christians live their lives by rules. I don't do this. I did when I first became a Christian. That's the way I live my life. I don't do this. I don't do that. You can't do this either. And if you do, then God's not going to love you. And I better do this and not do that or else I'm going to be in, you know, poop shed with God, and he's going to be mad at me, and you know. And so many Christians live that way. Yeah. 
We just have rules. And it's not what God says is the basis of our access to him. It's by faith. And it's into this grace. And we stand in it. What is grace? Right. It's God's unmerited, undeserved, unearned favor. We didn't earn it. What's not mercy? Getting, not getting what we do deserve. God's mercy is not getting what we deserve, which is hell. He didn't give us that. In fact, he gives us something that we can't possibly ever pay back, and that's eternal life, forgiveness of sins, justification, perfection in his sight, and a righteousness we didn't earn. And he gives all that to us by faith into this grace. Completely different way of living than the world and the religions of the world say. Many of the illustrations in the Old Testament were given to us to illustrate um, biblical truth. One of them is this idea that we were separated from God. One of the things about the temple in the Old Testament, it was surrounded by walls. The temple stood... There was a wall around the temple. Then there was a courtyard. Then there was another wall around the courtyard. Then there was another courtyard. And there was another wall around that courtyard. And each courtyard only allowed certain people to enter. For example, the outer courtyard, anyone could enter. Jews, Gentiles, women. Then the next courtyard, only the men could enter. And you had to be Jewish. And then in the next courtyard, only the priest could enter. So there was always this division, this, this separation that um, was instilled in the people. In fact, at the temple, there was a big plaque that was put on one of the walls. And this is actually the plaque. They found it um, in Jerusalem. And this inscription served as a warning to people pagan visitors, that is non-Jewish people, that if they went into the next courtyard, they were proceeding under penalty of death. One of the things that got Paul in trouble and arrested in Jerusalem when he was finally arrested and had to go to Rome in order to plead his case before Caesar, but in Jerusalem he was arrested. And the reason he was arrested was because the people started a rumor that Paul had brought a Jew or a non-Jew into the inner court. I and mean, so they, a riot erupted and they were going to stone Paul to death because under penalty, you could not bring a non-pagan or a non-Jew into the inner court. What this was saying was, yes, God loves everybody, but not everybody's welcome to just go walking in to the center courtyard where the religious activity of the Jews took place. See, God instilled that. But when Christ died on the cross, something marvelous and miraculous happened in the temple. Does anybody remember what happened? What happened? There was a veil. Yeah, there was a big veil. One of the things that marked most clearly the separation between God and man was this big veil. It was a curtain. It was thick. It was almost a foot thick. Huge, huge, thick curtain. And it separated the Holy of Holies, which was the most holy part of the temple, from the rest of the temple complex. And only the high priest could go into that, and only once a year, and only with the sacrifice, uh, the blood, sacrificial blood. And when Christ died on the cross, that veil was ripped from the top, Ripped in two, and it was opened up. Just <laughs> signifying the access that we now have to God. All of this separation, all of this you can't enter, all of this stay away, all of this God's mad at me, all of that is gone now when we come to Christ. What a wonderful benefit. So we've been justified by faith. We have peace. We have access. What else do we have? Let's uh, take a look at this marvelous makeover. We have a future. 
We are in Romans chapter 5. We now have oh, a sorry. future. Sorry. So we have a future with God. We rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. We rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Do you realize the future that you have? Some of us don't really take that in often enough where we just stop and meditate and contemplate on what are, what's your future going to be. Someday we're all going to die. It does. But oftentimes people just think, yeah, I'm going to die, I'm going to heaven, it's nice, and there's, you know, nice puffy clouds, and, you know, we're all... Man, it's much more than that. We re can celebrate what's going to happen in the future. Uh, turn to page 38 in your book if you have one. If not, I'll just read it. Yeah, 38. Paragraph, the first paragraph on chapter 38. We are in the book number two. Volume dos. Volume dos. Now check out, check out paragraph one on page 38. I'll go ahead and read it and you follow along. Page 38. We have a new promise for our enjoyment, is the heading. And it says, and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. This is the final tense of Paul's exciting declaration. Our salvation is anchored in the past because Christ has made peace with God for all who trust him. Our salvation is anchored in the present because by God's intercession, Christ's intercession, every believer stands securely in God's grace. And now we learn that our salvation is is also anchored in the future because God, because God gives every one of his children the promise that one day they will be clothed with the glory of his own son. Yeah. The glory of God will be clothed in the glory of God. What is the glory of God? We, are, and we rejoice in the hope that someday we're going to share in God's glory. What is God's glory? Yeah. It, there's often times in the Bible we get a glimpse of what the glory of God is. For example, when Moses went up on the mountain to receive the Ten Commandments, he asked God, show me your glory. And God said, I can't show you my glory because no one can see me and live. But I'll give you a taste of it. I'll just let you see my afterglow. And so God put Moses in a little cleft of the rock and covered it over and passed in front of him and then just allowed him to see just the, the train of God's glory. And what happened to Moses after seeing that glory when he came down from the mountain? Yeah, his face was shining, so shiny that the children of Israel couldn't even look at him. They're saying, cover that thing up, man. What is it, the heck is this, you know? Like the sun. A million gazillion times brighter than the sun. And when the children of Israel built the tabernacle, the glory of God came, and they all hid themselves. They were terrified because of the glory. It's, 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 it's everything that you could imagine in terms of brightness and clarity and cleansing and beauty. And it is where God lives. He lives in a realm of glory. And we can rejoice. We can celebrate the fact that someday we're going to share in that glory. You know, the Bible says we're all going to receive crowns. We're going to receive crowns for the good things we've done on the earth. It's our reward. There's lots of crowns. Crowns. And you're are... not going to receive crowns because you're not going to receive crowns. <laughs> Some people who don't do much for God aren't going to receive a lot of crowns. Some are going to receive a lot of uh, a lot of crowns. And the word crown is really the word corona. Yeah. Like Interesting, the huh? Like the beer. <laughs> like the beer. <laughs> but, but it's, well, know, it's the same it's word the same as the beer. Thing. Well, here's what happens when the when there's a total eclipse of the sun and the earth covers the sun, the only thing visible is what? 
called the corona. It's the corona. It's the radiance yes. emanating from the sun. Yes. The Bible says we're going to receive coronas. I really believe that what we're going to receive are some levels of glory, some levels of radiance, some levels of, of grandeur based on our levels of obedience to him. That's going to be our reward. Two and three. And what does First John 3, 2 say? It says, Beloved, it's the verse on top, now we are the sons of God. Right now. You and I, sons generic, sons and daughters of God. We are God's children. And it doesn't yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him. For we shall see him as he is. We're going to share in that glory. We're going to share in that marvelous environment and character that embellishes and incorporates and, in, and in, envelops God. That's pretty cool. That's a, per, that's a reason to rejoice, I think. And we have a purpose. And not only that, but we glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance, a perseverance character, character hope. And hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured uh, in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. So why does God let Christians suffer? If we have to rejoice in tribulations, how come we can't just go through life, everything hunky-dory? It, like it develops us and makes us more like Him. Look at what He says. It produces perseverance. What's perseverance? Yeah, stick, stick with it. Stick with it. And character turns us into better people. And character hope. How can tribulations bring hope? Because when we see God working in our lives and working through these sufferings, it brings hope to us. We can see, okay, this isn't as bad because I know he's going to make something good of this. And hope doesn't disappoint. Because God is there all the time. His love has been poured out in our hearts. We glory when problems come our way because we know that God works all things together for good. What a wonderful benefit we have. And we have a pardon for sin. God demonstrates his own love toward us then while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. This actually, this passage, and it says, when we were still without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet perhaps for a good man someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrates his love toward us that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. How much more then, having been justified by his blood, shall we be saved from wrath through him? So we have a pardon total from sin. This passage is actually considered the greatest declaration of God's love in the scripture. It really is a John 3.16 explained. God loved us. He sent his son to die for us. And which verse is it? This is verses 6 through 9. Mm -hmm. Chapter. Yeah. So what wrath is God going to save us from? It says God saved us. He will save us from wrath through him. We shall be saved from wrath through him. What wrath is he speaking of? Okay, hell certainly would be a, a wrath, wouldn't it? People get sent to hell because that's God's wrath against their sin. Tribulation? The great tribulation is called the wrath of God. Yeah. We're not going to have to go through that. We're not going to have to see the Antichrist. We're going to be raptured out of this world before the seven years tribulation. All wrath. Anything that is described as wrath on the world or on sin, we're going to be we're going to be delivered from that. But No, they suffer through tribulation. Okay, okay, well, and we can have hope in that tribulation. That's this verse. We glory in our tribulations. 
we are saved from God's wrath. So it's a whole different flavor. Yeah. And we have freedom from the penalty of sin forever. For when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son. Much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only that, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we now have received the reconciliation. So we're reconciled. We're completely and totally brought into favor. Reconciled means that we are brought into God's favor, whereas before we weren't. And all of this we have received because of our faith in Jesus Christ. We have peace with God. We have a purpose in life. We have a pardon from sin. We have access to God. We have been freed from sin forever. He saves us from sin forever. What a wonderful makeover, huh? That's a pretty good makeover. You'll never see that on HGTV. But we have received a wonderful extreme makeover from God. And Paul makes sure we can rejoice in that.